Hey, this is Eric from Catching Light. Hey, this is Hemp. Hey, this is Glenn. Hi, I'm Steve-O. Hey, this is Drew Hines with Hindsight Imagery. This is Matt Callahan at Digimati Photographic Services. Hey, this is Jason, and welcome to Tales from the Pit. Hello and welcome back to Tales from the Pit, the behind the lens access for concerts and photography. Today is our part two with professional concert goer, book author, and radio DJ, Lou Brutus. We hope you enjoy the episode. For myself as a photographer, it's always been a bucket list to be able to to get into Fenway and have the kind of access that you're talking about and, and shoot a Sox game. You've kind of been there, done that at this point. What have you got on your list, either rock and roll or sports or or or, for, or um, baseball or something like that? What's your bucket list like now? What have you got left to fill? Huh, you know, that's a good question. More lighthouses. I, I, I think I'd like to shoot more lighthouses. I think I'd like to get better. I, I want to get better at the stuff I do. Um, I want to become a better general photographer i want to get better skills with astrophotography uh one of my christmas presents this year i, I essentially it's just please buy me this for christmas <laughs> my family got me uh, uh it's by ioptron and it's uh basically like a clockwork sort of mechanism and you put it on a very heavy gauge tripod yeah. and yeah. then uh with a viewer you point at the north star at the sure. so you do a polar alignment visually and then you can mount a, most people use this for a camera. Some put a telescope on it, but what it does, it allows the camera, it moves with the stars. Yeah. Normally if I do a Milky Way shot, I do, I do, you know, wide field Milky Way. I don't have a telescope to zoom in on things. So, you know, if I, I'm traveling with Stone Sour and I'm in Idaho, well, then I'll go to Craters of the Moon or uh, City of Rocks National Park where there's no light pollution and you just get gorgeous stars at night. Uh, but normally for those pictures, you can only shoot for like 20, 25, 30 seconds. And then there's just too much movement to the stars and they, yeah. they start to trail a little bit. Yeah. Well, what this drive does, it has the camera move with the stars so depending on on how tight you get your alignment you can shoot you know up to two or three minutes um and the stars will not have moved in the frame and what that allows uh is the light from the stars that you can see with your, your uh, with the naked eye to be a lot brighter in the frame but also that allows the sensor the lens to drink in uh, over the course of the minute, two minutes, three minutes, the light of stars that you can't even see with the naked eye. So when you see these in, in, insane pictures of the Milky Way, and it looks like there's more stars than you could ever imagine, those are generally taken with this kind of a drive that, uh, again, moves the uh, the camera and the lens with the yeah. motion of the stars. So that's the kind of thing I, I want to learn and get better at. Um, I think most of my bucket list items tend to be locations I have never traveled before. Mm. And I want to see, like I've seen 46 out of the 50 States and I still have to make it to South Dakota, Montana, Oregon, and Oklahoma. And uh, I, I was going to try and make it to them this year. Obviously that didn't pan out. So one thing I, I, I have on my list to do as soon as I can travel, hopefully in 2021 I'm just saying, fuck it. Um, I'm 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 going to find a Saturday concert in Oklahoma. I'll fly to Oklahoma City or Tulsa on a Saturday morning. I'll see a concert. I'll shoot a concert. I'll fly home the next day. Oklahoma gone. Then you know, hopefully, I can hop on a bus with a band or a tour or something and do uh, Oregon, uh, South Dakota, Montana. The difficulty for me with traveling is I have sort of a rare neuro condition. Uh, it's called motor vestibular disorientation syndrome. So being in a car moving fast, it, my vision warps and uh, you get 
panic attacks and all this stuff. So it's, it's not fun. Um, so that means uh, I can't really highway drive. Once I hit 50, everything, my vision starts to go sideways. Um, so that, that has made traveling more difficult, at least by car. Um, Cause what I would have done at this point was just fly into one of those States and then just driven it and shot astrophotography at night, you know, and cause uh, the, the, those uh, States out West have great, dark night skies. So, uh, sure, you know, that's the main bucket dinner, list right? stuff. And, and some of the cities I haven't been to, uh, the, the three cities at the top of my list that I really want to go to that I've never been. Uh, the first top of the list is Florence, Italy, where I've always wanted to go since I was a little kid. And I'm ashamed I've never been there. I also want to see St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, also, I, I would love to go to Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, Iceland oh, yeah. has a beautiful night yep. skies. It, it's a fairly easy um, uh, trip from the East Coast, where I spend most of my time. Uh, uh, tons of lighthouses, great night skies, and uh, yep. good fish. So, uh, yeah, Iceland is very high on the list. Iceland, I think, is cheap to fly to. And then once you get yeah. there, a fucking hamburger is 30 bucks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> 30 and that's been bucks. on my list, too. Jesus. That's, yeah, that's that's definitely on top of my list. One of those. Yeah. Now you said you traveled with bands before in the past. Can you tell us some stories about some of your favorite uh, tours that you've been on and the crazy stuff that's happened? Um. Yeah. I mean, um, where to begin? Um, <laughs> Slipknot, because they're you know my favorite band. They're fun to travel with. Normally, I'll travel on Corey's bus. Um. He's he's very kind, uh, and again, like you mentioned before, he wrote the you know wrote the fucking oh. forward to my book right there. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, one one of the games that I've always played with him is uh, you know, and I understand he's one of the biggest rock stars on the planet. I still like to bust his balls a little bit, but you know, I'm I'm a good ten or twelve years older than him, so I like to tease him about the bands I saw. So he'll kid me about my age, but then I'll throw back. But you didn't see Black Sabbath on the Technical Ecstasy tour, did you? <laughs> you know, that's sort of back and forth, and that's fun, and, and that's what we'll do on the bus. So uh, traveling with uh, Slipknot or Stone Sour is um, is a lot of fun. Um, Seven Dust are great guys, you know. I think it was two falls ago. I remember doing an overnight trip from uh, Green Bay down to Janesville, Wisconsin with Seven Dust and Morgan Rose and I. We just stayed up all night talking about baseball, you know, because M Morgan is like one of us. He's not only a rock and roll kind of guy, he is also a degenerate baseball fan. And um, actually, I remember one night, it was the closing night of a Hard Drive Live tour. Seven Dust was the headliner and we were closing the tour. What we had done, I, I had showed up at various stops on the tour, one of which was Atlantic City. That was, uh, that. oh, th this is another story that'll go into the book. We went to the bar afterwards. I used to drink back then. I barely drink anymore. And, and we all got really, really hammered. Uh, and as happens, sometimes when you're drunk, you think something will be funny that maybe other people won't think is funny. So uh, I go out onto the boardwalk and there's like a all night French fry stand or something. Uh, and and I, I get the French fries and I think, well, why don't I put a trail of French fries down and lead a flock of seagulls onto the casino floor? <laughs> Let awesome. me tell you firsthand, casinos don't like it when you bring in flocks of seagulls onto the <laughs> casino floor at three o'clock in the morning. I, I can state this with, with no small amount of surety. So that was early in the tour. We closed out the tour on my birthday, November 10th at the house of blues in Orlando. And, um, uh, there's a guy backstage. We're having a big party afterwards. It's the close of the tour. It's my birthday. Where everybody's drinking, smoking, cursing, and there's a, a guy, and he's he's got got a really good looking date with him, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, man, I know this guy. What band does he play in? Or is he in radio? And I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to say, dude, what's your name? Because it's somebody I feel I should know. And and then it it finally dawns on my drunk ass. It's it's Johnny Damon of the Yankees. Oh, Morgan is a huge Yankees fan, and Johnny is a big you know Seven Dust fan. So he lived nearby showed up at the gig that night so uh, uh although he i he he was well behaved the rest of us were behaving like fucking animals <laughs> the rest of uh but uh but johnny was okay you know he, he was a good dude he was a friendly dude so 
He used to be a Red Sox player, too, as a matter of fact. Oh, he had great years with the Red Sox. Yeah, he did. When I first started shooting baseball, uh, he was on the Red Sox. And I remember shooting uh, uh, some great day games. Um, uh, Damon um, Manny was with the Red Sox then. Do you remember the game where Manny made a catch in left field and then ran up the fence and high-fived a Red Sox fan? And then threw the ball back in and like completed a double play. Yeah. I was at that game. I shot that game, but we were on the, we were in the, the, the third base on deck circle. So we couldn't see that corner. So I'm shooting the infield. I don't even know what the hell happened. And everybody goes crazy. I'm like, yeah, wonder what happened. (laughs) And and I got home that night. Knucklehead moment. Say again. It's a great Manny knucklehead moment. Oh, it's, it's one of his most famous. And I was there <laughs> and I missed it. No picture. I didn't even see it happen. <laughs> uh, he was actually really good. Um, uh, not, not so he was a, obviously a fabulous player, um, but he realized, and this might sound big headed to people, but it's not. And I, I, I have the same sort of things with, uh, with a rod when he was still playing with the Yankees, these guys understand that it's very important that the photographers get their shots of these guys. And it's not big headed. It's, it's, it's a fact. And um, they, they get the marketing aspect of it. Well, they get the marketing aspect of it. And they also know that the photographers are out there working like everybody else. And, you know, they're most of the photographers are good guys and girls. Um, So they want to make sure you get your shot. So Manny was coming in, would come in from the outfield. And if he, and I don't mean like they're going to interrupt their play to pose for a picture, but as they're coming off the field, like Manny, if he saw you taking a picture, he'd slow down, make sure he got your picture, give you the nod and keep going. A rod warming up at third base, looked over, sees me shooting, looks at the camera, gives the nod. Like, Hey, you got your picture. There you go. Uh, I remember Tony La Russa once uh, he was managing the Cardinals at that point. Uh, third base on deck circle. And he's sort of back halfway in the tunnel. And I'm, I'm going to try and sneak a picture because you always got to get pictures of the manager, especially a, a guy you knew is going to, you know, Hall of Fame level like La Russa. And I think he doesn't notice me. And I just about the, got the camera up. And La Russa goes like this. Ugh. And he goes back. He puts on his sunglasses. And then he goes back. And then he takes his pose again. And I'm like, fire my burst and go, Tony, thanks a lot. And he just went. And he took his glasses off. He was like, I know you need your picture. Take your fucking picture. <laughs> and so I can go back to managing my ball club. So it's actually pretty funny. And again, it's not big headed to those guys. It's just they understand it's important. And I, I think at least in LaRusse's case, he probably figures if I don't give this asshole his shot, he's going to be pointing at me all. Let's just get it done with, you know, so. While you're kind of geeking out on sports a little bit, um, I coach uh, high school football, and I understand that you have a good Bo Schembechler story. I have uh, the best. I have the craziest Bo Schembechler story in history, uh, and there is, in fact, a chapter in the book. Uh, it's entitled <laughs> The Time I Accidentally Became a Rock Star and Simultaneously the Most Hated Man in the state of Michigan. And uh, it's the longest chapter in the book. I just did a reading of it around the, uh, the, uh, around what was supposed to be the eve of the uh, Ohio state Michigan game for folks who do not know the rivalry between OSU and Michigan goes back over a century. And back in 2000 ESPN rated what they considered the biggest rivalries in sports. Seven was Red Sox Yankees, the number one um, uh, rivalry in sports was Ohio State, Michigan. So that gives you an idea, the the sort of headbutting and hatred that goes on between the two schools and teams. Anyway, um, I was uh, a long time had been aware of the rivalry, but I had some friends in a great band out of Columbus, Ohio, where Ohio State is called Watershed. And they super got me interested in the rivalry and uh, Ohio State football. So for a goof, I, I created a band based on the rivalry, a, uh, a punk band that supposedly had been around for decades, named after Bo Schembechler called the Dead Schembechlers. And they would dress like the old Ohio State coach 
Woody Hayes, and they would sing songs, short punk rock songs about how Bo Schembechler and everybody at the University of Michigan football squad sucked. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, and the guys from Watershed, I tell them about this goofy idea and they're like, we really got to do this. So we take pictures, we dress as Woody Hayes, we go to a local recording studio in Columbus, we record songs like Michigan Stadium is a pile of shit, Ann Arbor girls are dirty whores, I hate Michigan, fuck the Wolverines, and uh, we're, we're going to go out and do a gig on the eve of the game. Well, the next thing we know, it explodes and we're on the front page of the Detroit Free Press. The next year we come back to do another gig. We sell out a thousand seater. And the third year after that, we are going to headline the Newport Music Hall in Columbus. This is a 1700 seat venue. We sell it out clean. It's going to be the biggest game in the history of the rivalry at that point, because not only are both teams unbeaten, they are ranked one and two had never happened before. Had do you remember what year this before. was? Say again. Do you remember what year that would have been? Uh, I think it was 11 years ago. I think it was 2009. Uh, but I, I will probably be wrong on that. No, that's so fine. I, I'm just curious. I went to uh, Marietta College in Ohio. So I'm all the stuff you're talking about. I'm oh, right sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're, yeah. So you're super familiar with, with all of this sort of lore. Yeah. That, and, and, and people have to understand who are not familiar. It, it, the, the Michigan-Ohio State game in both states is of biblical proportion. It's, yeah. it's the biggest thing that happens all year. So anyway... Here we are with our band, Dead Schembecklers, and we come into what's called Hate Week, and uh, it's going to be the biggest game in the history of the rivalry. And uh, a week before that, Bo Schembechler had learned about our band for the first time. John Nio, uh, a sports writer for the Detroit Times, uh, is at Bo's office that he shared with his son, Shemmy, and said, Bo, have you ever heard of the Dead Schembecklers? And he said, what the hell? And they cleaned up the quotes for the newspaper article. I'll, I'll tell you what they actually were as, as per John, the reporter. He said, the dead Shemmeckler, what the hell is that? And he said, well, frankly, they're a punk band from Columbus. They sing about how you and the Wolverines suck and they dress like Woody Hayes. And he goes, bullshit. There is no such thing. <laughs> so the reporter takes Bo to my site and, and he looks at it and he's not mad. He's elated because he realizes oh he's still public enemy number one in Columbus, even though he hadn't been head coach, he had been AD for, for, you know, sure. decades. And, and here was the quote that they cleaned up for the newspaper article. He, he's looking at the screen. He goes, I'll be damned. They do dress like Woody. And he looks up at his son and says, see, I still fucking matter in Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so Monday comes around, it's the week of the big game. And uh, we are now uh, poised to, you know, the, the show is going to sell out. We're going to make a ton of money. We're going to sell out all of our merch. But then things really start to get crazy. Do I have a, a couple more minutes to finish the story? Go ahead. Yeah, oh, yeah sure. Plenty of time. Shit, now, now, Lloyd Carr was the, the Michigan coach at this point, and, and he was not real good at doing press. So Bo Schembechler, as uh, athletic director for the school, you know, he did uh, a, a lot of the, the big press stuff for them. So that Monday, he, he walked in front of a literal gymnasium filled with reporters to answer questions. And he's got to answer about a recent heart scare that he had had because he had had heart problems for many years. And, uh, you know, they're one and two. They're unbeaten. Biggest game in the rivalry. Oh, my God, Bo. But before anybody can ask a question, he goes, hey, hey, everybody hold up for a minute. I got to ask you a question. Have any of you ever heard of the Dead Schembecklers. <laughs> Boom. We end up in the New York Times, the mm. Sydney, Australia Times, the LA Times, the, the, the Statesman and Austin. We end up literally in every newspaper on the planet because the sports writers, you know, they can only write about the game so much. Everybody's looking for some other human interest or, or B story. And we became it. So during the course of the week, they're quoting our lyrics Every few minutes on ESPN Sports Center, and <laughs> HBO is sending a documentary team that they oh were shooting God. the rivalry that year, wow. and they, they they wanted to come to our show and shoot our footage. We set up a, a big press conference in the lobby of the Newport Music Hall for the afternoon of the show. Everybody is coming. I swear to God, 
Everybody is coming. All of the networks, ESPN, all of the sporting press. It's going to be packed. And we're going to be addressed as Woody Hayes in character, screaming about the evil of the international Wolverine conspiracy to enslave mankind and why we hate <laughs> Michigan. It's going to we on that day, on that Friday, the day of our gig. And this is not an exaggeration or an idle boast for that one day. We, the Dead Schembecklers, are the hottest fucking band in rock and roll. We're not the biggest band in rock and roll, but that day, there was no other rock band on the planet generating more press, more talk. Sports radio stations across the country, especially in Michigan and Ohio, are we're, we're the number one topic. The Dead Schembecklers are evil. The Dead Schembecklers should be banned. It's fucking nuts. And we're right in the middle of it. And it's starting to get scary because there's reporters digging through the garbage of the other musicians in the band. Um, so anyway, just when we thought it couldn't get weirder enough, we're, we're putting on our Woody Hayes outfits and we've got to go over for the press conference. And we're, we're walking out of uh, Joe A. Strike's house where I'm staying. It's the bass player for the band. Um, and uh, I said, hey, let me check my email one last time. It's pre smartphone days. So I go back to my my, you know, 40 pound laptop that I was using back then. And uh, I see John Nio, the reporter I'd mentioned before, has sent me an email. And the email says this. Bo Schembechler just collapsed on the set of his TV show. Get ready. It's bad. And I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. And we immediately run to the TV set and turn on ESPN and the news hits Bo Schembechler has just died. Wow. We are the dead Schembecklers and we're fucked. We're, we have gone from being hottest band on the planet for the day to lepers. It's just, it, 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 if you put it into a fictional book, there's no fucking way anybody would believe it could ever happen. I was just like, going to say, it's like a script. So, yeah, like it's just impossible to have, and yet it happened. So we suddenly have got to figure out what the fuck we're going to do. And at first I'm like, well, we have to cancel the concert. We, we can't play. We can't have dead shit. We can't, we can't do this. Because um, for all the, excuse me, the hatred inside of the... Um, the music, we're all huge college football fans and, and you know, love Woody Hayes, but love Bo Schembechler, too, even though he was the evil enemy, because, the, you know, yeah. there's a right way to hate in sports rivalries and there's a wrong way to hate. It's like Red we Sox certainly... fans. Red Sox fans all hated Billy Martin. But, you know, when Billy Martin died, everybody was bummed. Well, and, and you know, when Jeter played there for the last time, you know, the Red Sox, yeah, fans, yeah. they fucking hated Jeter. Yeah. But they liked him, and they they were there's again there's good hate and there's bad hate. Yeah, sports. there's a certain amount of respect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, Jeter got a stand ovation his last game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Schembechler, you know, from his reaction and and the way he promoted us and talked us up that week, you know, he understood where we were coming from. Even he though on you on purpose. <laughs> Well, you know, I said that on stage that night. I'm like, that old man fucked us good on the way out because <laughs> well, what we decided to do. Uh, and it was it was Joe and Colin, uh, guitar player and bassist in the band, who said, fuck it. We can't not play the show and the promoter might sue us anyway. It's a sold out show. We can't not play. So we decided to take all of our profits from the show and donate them to the Bo Schembechler Heart of a Champion Fund. And, and we went out and did the show that mm-hmm. night. And uh, we did our best to sort of walk the fine line between being hating Michigan and being our normal disrespectful selves, but also paying tribute to, to Bo Schembechler as best we could. And, and we actually heard back from Shemmy, his son and uh, his family, and they, they loved what we did. And, you know, we, we sent them a sizable check, you know, it was a lot of fucking money. As I signed the check, I had this, this picture in my mind of like a, in a cartoon, a big bag of money with wings flying away, <laughs> flying away and get, giving our hard earned Buckeye bucks to, um, uh, to the uh, University of Michigan, but uh, it was it was insane. It was just the craziest thing, and and I contend this, and and I you know Lord knows who will watch this or who has read the book or that particular chapter, but I mention it in the chapter and I mention it in the acknowledgments at the end. The book itself, there's plenty of stories, and as a, a collective, it would it might make a good movie, but I swear to God in heaven, I think this dead Schembechler's chapter would make the most incredible 
rock and roll sports film ever made. I mean, the story I just told you, the fact that we just became fucking famous overnight for a band singing songs like Bomb Ann Arbor Now or <laughs> I Wipe My Ass with Wolverine Fur. But then all of this <laughs> other stuff happens. It, 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 I'm doing rock and roll stuff for 40 years. And uh, as I point out in the book, I've seen a lot of crazy shit, a lot of bad shit, a lot of funny shit, but I've never seen any, anything as unlikely as happened with us in the dead Chembecklers. And I'm not saying that because I, I was in the middle of it. I'm saying it because you ask anybody else and it's like, they can't believe that happened. So, um, you know, I, I'd love to see Cameron Crowe or somebody turn it into a film. Listen, uh, ESPN it, it deserves it. It deserves it. Say again. I said, there's an ESPN 30 for 30 in there for sure. It's, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And, and to this day, Michigan fans still want to burn us at the stake. And there's a lot of Ohio state fans. They treat us like the crazy uncle chained up in the attic, you know, like <laughs> yeah, they come out, they come out for the game every year. So, uh, you know, next year, since we were unable to play for our, our supposed 30th anniversary this year, the band um, uh, and all of the characters that we portray have announced next year, since the game is in Ann Arbor, we are in fact playing in Ann Arbor. We are going to oh bring the dead Schembecklers to play <clears throat> in Ann Arbor, Michigan on the eve of the game next November. I, I don't know how well that's going to go over in the state of Michigan, but we're going to find out. And uh, we're going to record some new music before then, too. So, Jeez, yeah, we need to get more, more to do next John year to get him some. See, we get a road trip coming up to Michigan next. next you know, I got to tell you, guys you should all come out and shoot it. I got to tell you, the, 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 the Michigan uh, Ohio State game in Michigan has been a bucket list game oh, yeah. for me for my entire life. So that would just be phenomenal if we could go do that. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned in the chapter that. Um, I um I attended the rivalry game one year at the Horseshoe at Ohio State and uh, it's incredible. I it, it's one of the most incredible things I've ever attended in my life and uh, you know it's up there with seeing a live eclipse, total solar eclipse uh, a few years ago and some of the 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 great uh, music and stage shows that I've seen in my life, like Live Aid was like that, or Metallica and Tuck Tuck Tuck. There, there are some things that I've been at that I, I, I knew at the time. I'm like, shit, this is, you know, this is really something else. And this is something that not a lot of people get to see or hear or enjoy. So, uh, you know, not a day goes by where I don't thank my lucky stars and or guardian angels for all the stuff that I get to do. So, Lou, uh, somewhere in your book, you mentioned something about an interview with Snoop Dogg. Could you tell us something about that? It was kind of an impromptu interview. Yeah. You know, the chapter, and I'll show you the illustration. The uh, The chapter is entitled, The Time Snoop Dogg Got Me So High, I Drooled in My Own Lap. That's and uh, that was one of the Project Revolution tours. I, I'm sure you guys remember Lincoln Park used to put together these yep. awesome summer tours. They, they, when it got really big, they played primarily uh, amphitheaters in the summertime. Excuse me. I went to cover it in Camden, New Jersey. And uh, after I finished all my press for that day, and including Chester and all the guys in Lincoln Park, my producer of the time came up to me and said, hey, I know you're done, and it's not on your schedule, but would you want to talk to Snoop Dogg? And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to talk to Snoop Dogg. <laughs> he's, a, you know, I'm not a huge hip hop fan, but he's a super interesting guy. He's really good at what he does. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor. I thought, man, I'd be an ass not to want to talk to to Snoop. And and just recently at that point, you guys might recall, um, there, there was like this wave of news. Snoop is clean. Snoop's not yeah. smoking. Snoop is off. Snoop is off the smoke or whatever the fuck they were going on about back then. So anyway, I, I said, you know, I didn't get to do my normal preparation for the interview. It was just kind of, hey, we're going to go to his dressing room now, knock on the door. He's expecting you. And uh, you'll have to wing it. So I, I thought, you know, I would start with that thing. So I, I get to the door of the dressing room and uh, it opens a crack. And it's like a Cheech and Chong movie where there's like pressure steamed <laughs> dope smoke <laughs> coming out of the door. And, and you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, Snoop's got his guys in there. And, and he, in fact, had a posse. Some people say, I got my posse with me. And it's just you and your dumbass friends. 
Snoop, I would imagine that that's an official posse. So he's got his posse in there. And I'm thinking, well, his posse smoking, but you know, Snoop is clean. I, I have bought the news hook, line and singer. So I go in and, um, uh, sort of to warm him up. I, uh, I gave him a mini Cohiba. I just come back from Bermuda and you can get Cuban cigars there. And I don't really smoke cigars, but I get those little cigarillo sized mini Cohibas like Clint Eastwood would smoke in the old Westerns. And uh, so you can hand it out when you get back. Hey, Cuban cigar, you know, for fun. And uh, Snoop and I go to sit down on a, on a couch in the dressing room and there's a, you know, a coffee table and some other chairs around it. And th there's a great big cigar in the middle of the table. And I think, Oh, he smokes cigars. I'll offer him a mini Cohiba. And I said, oh, hey, Snoop, mini Cohiba, Cuban cigar. And Snoop takes one. He goes, Lou Brutus, a true pimp. Thank you. And he lights it up. And I'm like, I'm in with Snoop. So I, I, start, I start to roll on the interview. And uh, oh, yeah. Snoop lights his cigar. And as soon as it's lit, he hands it to me. And I'm like, well, what a kind fellow Mr. Dog is to offer me one of his, oh my God, it's marijuana. And it's a fucking blunt. And I, I noticed this not only from the smell, but there's uh, from out of the, the end I'm supposed to hit, there's uh, the end of a bud. And it's like this nuclear green glowing three mile island Fukushima oh radioactive shit. And I'm like, <laughs> at this point, I haven't smoked weed in like 10 years. And the last oh. time uh, I had smoked weed before that, uh, I also go into in the book, Hunter S. Thompson had handed me a joint. Well, if Hunter Thompson handed you a joint back in the day, you didn't say I don't smoke. You fucking smoked it. And you were happy. So anyway, I'm holding the blunt and I'm like, oh, man, what? A, like, I got to drive three hours from here back to the DC area. I can't, you know, and, and Snoop was like staring at me and his guys all start to stare at me. And I'm like, they think I'm a fed. Like I can't not smoke this. So I hit it and it goes around the table. And I, I asked the first question, it comes to me and I hit it a second time. And, uh, and then I turned it down after that. I was so inhumanly fucking high uh, that I went afterwards. Two hits, two hits. And, and two honest hits, but not two, you know, lung filling, you know, uh, uh, out in the wilderness, breathing the fresh air kind of hits. Just two regular hold it in for a few second hits. Uh, you know, and granted, I hadn't smoked in many years by then, but this was some sort of, you know, Snoop death weed. So I go out to watch <laughs> porn, who was also on the bill that night. They had, uh, let, you know, they had offered to let me watch from the, uh, uh, the soundboard. And I end up, and, and there's grim detail in the book chapter, I end up with a puddle of drool in my own lap and a rope of thick, snotty drool from the corner of my mouth down to my lap. I look like an extra from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <gasps> Just like, uh. And then I had to drive home totally paranoid. You know, uh, it, was, it was not a pleasant experience. Anyway, this is the uh, illustration uh, of... The event uh, as done by Alan McVeigh. Oh my God. <laughs> there I am exhaling and seeing little kittens and munchies. And that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, Snoop's it, the it, freaking it, it icon. I love him. And, um, you know, uh, Rockfest in Godot, Wisconsin, which I host each year, big multi day festival uh, that was canceled this year. Snoop was to co headline one night with Limp Biscuit. They will be back for the 2021 edition in July of next year. And, uh, I'm, you know, I'll bring a copy of the uh, the chapter to Snoop. And, uh, you know, hopefully he won't think it's too goofy. You know, he, again, I, as far as I've been able to tell, he's got a pretty good sense of humor. So, uh, you know, hopefully he'll enjoy it. And uh, yeah. he was at our venue a couple of years ago, wasn't he? Yeah, Last, last summer. Last, yeah. 19. Team, yeah, right? yeah, I got to shoot that show. That was that was fun. That was that was. If you remember draft night, that was my first pick. Yeah, yeah he, he he's that. a great he's a great live performer, uh, and it's fun to see him both on hip hop bills, but also uh, when he's mixed in on on rock bills. I I love bills like that. You know, it harkens back to a degree. Excuse me, to the old days when you would see the Woody Herman big band open for the who at winterland in san francisco where promoter bill graham would uh put together um you know like great blues artists and great uh folk and roots artists uh to open for rock bands and uh, you know one thing that a, a lot of people don't realize is uh, a lot of the first wave blues men 
Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, B.B. King. Well, you could argue that there were people before them, but, you know, these guys became really big, not because anybody in the United States gave them support, but it was a lot of these British bands sure. that covered their songs and brought them to a, a far larger, more mainstream audience here in the United States. Uh, you know, Led Zeppelin was, uh, you know, instrumental in that. The Who very instrumental in that. I remember doing, um, I, I've interviewed The Who many times through the years. Uh, Roger Daltrey, I had a long conversation uh, with him about the blues guys. And, uh, you know, he had nothing but great things to say. And, and they were, you know, uh, at that point, you know, The Who had become one of the biggest bands in the world, but they were like kids uh, around people like B.B. King. They just, they just were geeking out, fanboying out, you know? And I, I love stories like that from huge artists too. You know, everybody has their favorites. Everybody has their heroes. Going back, I mean, you've you've seen it all, you've done it all, everything like that. I mean, you you've got the full history of rock and roll almost. Is there ever, is there any shows or artists or locations that you missed that you would you know you wish you would have seen live or something to that effect? Top of the list, and I had tickets for them twice and had the flu both times. Queen with Freddie Mercury. Oh, I had man. tickets for them at the Spectrum in Philadelphia on the fucking News of the World tour, which I really would have liked to have seen. Uh, and I had tickets again for them on the Hot Space tour. Billy Squire was the opening band, oh, uh, the Brendan Byrne Arena in East Rutherford, New Jersey. But you have to understand that, uh, like I mentioned at the top of the interview, growing up in Central Jersey, we could go to t concerts in New Jersey, Asbury Park, Passaic. East Rutherford by that time had the Brendan Byrne Arena and Giant Stadium. And, you know, there's Madison Square Garden and all the venues in New York, or there was Nassau Coliseum out on Long Island. And there was all the Philly places and, and Atlantic City. Queen, they toured all the time back then. So missing Queen to me was like, oh, it's Queen. You know, right. they'll, they'll play the Spectrum in three more months. And I just never, it just never worked out where I got to see Freddie Mercury. Um, the first time I saw any of the members Queen perform live was, and, and this is one of the shows when people ask, what's the best show that you ever saw? I, I can never really quite answer that. I, I throw out a flurry of answers, but one of them is always the Freddie Mercury tribute show at Wembley Stadium. And um, that was the year after Freddie died from AIDS. It was really a, a, a very sad day in Britain that day that the concert was held. Freddie passing away was, was, was just horrible, horrible news for the Brits. A huge rock star here, but he was like a patron saint in, in Britain. I don't think people here in the States quite understand the importance of Freddie Mercury to sort of the psyche to our friends in, in Great Britain. But on the day of the Freddie Mercury concert, Benny Hill passed away. Uh, and and again, very big and popular here in the United States. But Benny Hill was some sort of comedic demigod over in the UK. And it was it was really it was, it was an interesting but very sad time to be in Britain. Uh, anyway, um, the Freddie Mercury tribute show uh, it essentially happened in two halves uh, and it started early in the day. Um, Def Leppard played a set, Metallica played a set, Extreme played a set. So you had all these different bands doing short festival sets of, you know, 25, 30 minutes, something like that. Then the second half of the show was the surviving members of Queen bringing out a bevy of rock stars to sing in Freddie Mercury's place. So James Hetfield comes out and does Stone Cold Crazy. Uh, Annie Lennox comes out with David Bowie and does Under Pressure. Bowie is on stage at one point and they do a Mott the Hoople reunion and Mick Ronson and Ian Hunter and David Bowie and they do all the young dudes. You know, not a lot of people realize the first big tour Queen did in the United States was opening for Mott the Hoople. And uh, a very old friend of mine, uh, his name is Chip, uh, I call him the Lice Dog. He's from Keensburg, New Jersey. He saw, I think it may have been the first Queen gig in the U.S. I'm not sure. It was certainly on that first tour. It was Mott the Hoople and Queen at the Eurus Theater in New York City. This is like, you know, 1972 or 1973, whatever that first Queen tour of the States was. So uh, uh, anyway, that, that Queen show, you know, um, I think it was Show Must Go On was Elton John and Elton John also did a duet with Axl Rose. It was, it was just, it was insane. 
Uh, and, and that was still one of the best shows I saw. But anyway, very long answer to your question. Queen with Freddie Mercury, definitely at the top of the list of uh, people that I did not get to see that I, I definitely wanted to see. I've, I've also never seen, maybe not as big a, uh, an artist, but uh, Rick Derringer. Um, who first came up, uh, you know, he, uh, he had a hit when he was just a teenager with Hang On Sloopy with a, mm -hmm. a local Cleveland band called the McCoys. But they, it was almost like the wonders in um, uh, That Thing You Do. Overnight, boom, they have this huge national hit. Uh, and Derringer had other hits like Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo. And he was a touring member and producer and writer with uh, the Edgar Winter Group for many years. But I've never seen Rick Derringer in concert. Closest I came was standing outside one of his gigs at Julio South, a rock club in Asbury Park back in, God, I don't even think I drove yet. This had to be in the 1970s sometime. And finally, the bouncer shooed me away from the door. They're like, kid, we're going to, the cops are going to arrest all of us. Like, you can't stand here at the door and watch the band. Uh, you know, Twisted Sister, I first saw standing outside of, uh, I was way too young to go to bars, uh, but they, they would, play a biker bar in Jamesburg, New Jersey called Emmett's. And uh, we would we would like watch through the door uh, and Twisted Sister, who, who they were a bar band at this point. They were wearing just like women's lingerie on stage. Meanwhile, there would be biker fights out in the gravel parking lot and guys like whipping each other with chains and like chains and zip guns and stuff. It was nuts. Uh, but that was my childhood. You know, it was fun. It was fun. We saw shit. You know, it was New Jersey. So I mean, we've we you've you've kind of geez. I mean, you've got the full gambit of everything. Um, but I haven't I haven't slept in forty years. So, you know. <laughs> so, I, yeah. so I have the raccoons the raccoon rings under my eyes. Well, it's amazing. You, you know, with the energy you have, it's you know you've you know I think you I don't think anyone else could do what you're doing with the energy you have. So you know, kudos to you for for doing it all. That's awesome. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. I, I listen. I'm. I, I'm I'm I always do when people ask what I do for a living overall, usually I just say I'm a professional music fan. I'm just a music fan who is lucky enough to go pro because I had no other marketable talents. You know, what have you done with your life so far when I was getting out of high school? And I'm like, uh, I memorized liner notes to thousands of albums and I went to a lot of concerts. What what can I do with that? And uh, you know, I remember I always wanted to be on the radio since I was a kid, you know, going back to, you know, listening to uh, radio stations like WABC 77 ABC in New York and uh, great uh, DJs. And uh, one of the dedications in, in the book is to Dan Ingram, who is a, just a phenomenal DJ. And there were others like Harry Harrison and Ron Lundy. Uh, I always knew I wanted to do that. But when I started to go to concerts, you know, I, I knew I, I couldn't do music. I, I had no talent. Um, but I noticed the only other person on stage at the shows was the DJ. So, you know, Vinnie Skelza or uh, Scott Muni of uh, Scott Muni at WNEW FM, New York, where rock lives. You know, I noticed these guys got to go on stage. And I'm like, well, shit, he introduced the band for 10 seconds. Well, even I could do that, you know. So that was uh, another reason why I had to, you know, get the kind of jobs that I ended up getting, you know. You are a professional conversationalist. Yes. Rack on tour, rock and roll, rack on tour. There you go. You know, um, it's good work if you can get it. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. You guys have any other questions you want to ask you guys? I'm very oh, satisfied. I kind of hogged this one down. there, Jason. Sorry. Oh, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Cheap trick said, speak now or forever hold your peace. And it starts with Mr. Tom Peterson on the bass. That's from Live at Budokan. <laughs> so um, I can yeah, quote but... albums and films at will. We can go a hundred straight hours and I won't repeat myself. I can't quote what I'm I so had. For breakfast. I'm so fucking pathetic. Oh, yeah, I can quote movies all day. Yeah. <laughs> no, dude, I could talk to you all day and night about, you know, just, you have so much information from, you know, you know, like I said, we're, we're venue photographers. So we only see the stage side of things. We don't get to see the backs backside of the industry and you've kind of lived it. Uh, you were the fly on the wall for so many things. Um, one final question I have for you is, you started in radio and radio has morphed in so many different ways. What was that? You know, can you give a little bit of an insight of what your experience was from terrestrial radio to serious you know, XM merger, all that stuff. Any, you have any sort of any guidance on how radio has changed at all? You know, I mean, it's always been changing. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly, I think maybe some of the more bedrock changes are more profound the last 10 or so years. Um, But, uh, you know, the basics of the job, uh, the, the basics of being a professional music fan have really not changed. Um, you try and stay up on music and on the artists and to present it well and present it fairly. Uh, you know, I, I always try and, and treat everybody that I meet. It doesn't matter if they're the lead singer of the headlining band or, you know, whoever it is mopping up the floor at the end of the night. And by the way, I used to have jobs like mopping up the floor at night. So I'm not putting anybody down for it. You know, it is my fervent belief that if you want to do well in the rock and roll business or any business or just in life in general, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. And and something else to remember, particularly for, you know, getting interesting content for the radio, everybody has a story. Everybody has interesting things that that you can learn from them. It could be a waiter or waitress or bartender at the gig, or it can be the stage manager or the local crew. I talk to, I just go and I just talk with everybody. You learn shit and it's fun. Um, that's why like when, when I go to festivals, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever I got to do backstage and then I'll be in the photo pit for however long I can be in the photo pit. But I spend the rest of the time, I just wait out in the audience. I, I like to get out in the audience and I want to meet fellow music fans. And I want to know what they're thinking and I want to know what they listen to and where they came from. And, you know, it's the only way that you can learn and stay up on things, I think. I mean, you know, it, it's it's the best way that I found. Um, and, and again, I, I enjoy it. I love to travel. I love to meet people. I, I just love to to get out in, into the, the world of music and, and sort of be inundated by it all. But, but I, I, you know, in some ways, you know, knock on wood, um, I, I get the best of both worlds where I can go on the road for a week, but then I can go home. I don't have to be out away from my family for six months. That sucks, man. It's hard on people. Um, so I, I, I try and sort of, you know, ride all of these different waves. I, I guess that's the, uh, the easiest way to put it. Yeah. So, uh, I think, you know, hopefully a lot of people uh, in the, are well aware of your book, but if they're not. You mean this one, Sonic Warrior, My Life is a Rock and Roll Reprobate, <laughs> Tales of Sex, Drugs, and Vomiting at Inopportune Moments, available everywhere you get books, ebooks, and audiobooks, including Amazon, on sale for just $20, or perhaps Barnes & Noble. Or you can order direct from my publisher, Rare Bird Lit. Those are, in fact, list price books at $28, <laughs> but they are signed by me and Darla the Wonder Dog. Yeah, what that one. I, I know how to one. horror my book at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's the one we wanted to talk about. Yeah. You go pimp down, in the man. book. What do you do for a living, boy? I'm a book pimp. <laughs> and, pimp uh, in the book. It's a, yeah, and I, I, again, I highly recommend the audio book. Just hearing you tell your stories. Uh, he, well, you know what? Great. But you should really point out that it's best to buy the physical book and the audio book. That way you can follow along as I'm doing it. As I'm doing it in your ears, there you go. There so you, you, and, uh, you may as well get the ebook, so you've got the full trifecta of rock and roll bullshit from your old pal Lou <laughs> Brutus. You know, just go, just go for it. And yep. this holiday season, I don't know if it'll make your your gift list happy if they get my book, but it'll sure as hell make me and my my lit agent happy. So there you yeah. go. Uh, website, social media, yeah. Uh, where do people go there? Yeah, very active on all that. Um, LouBrutus.com. Actually, I got to put a website uh, update up. Uh, but the website actually gives you a, you know, a good overview of the career and a lot of the crazy stuff I've done. And there are many, many photo galleries, astrophotography, including the, um, you know, I got um, one shot in National Geographic of the, uh, the uh, eclipse. It was really weird. Uh, I was shooting in a... Um, cemetery in Saluda, South Carolina, which is right in the path of totality and, and pretty close to the center. So it was going to be a long eclipse. And it's just this very small little out of the way town in South Carolina. I was there with my my aunt Min, who I mentioned before, and my uncle Gene, her husband. And um, at the height of the eclipse, a plane flew directly through the, the eclipse right over the disk of the sun and the moon. And I got the plane silhouetted in, in the aura of the the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And uh, that made all sorts of best of the eclipse galleries around the world. That, that got, that got me in uh, tons of newspapers all over the world. So, uh, awesome. so yeah, there's, there, there's all that on the website, uh, 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 Twitter and Instagram at Lou Brutus and the public page is Lou Brutus rocks on Facebook. And they, they all got the blue check Mark thing. So I can hold my head up high. Cause I, I have no, uh, <laughs> 
I, I have no self-respect. So, you know. Well, Lou, we can't thank you enough for all. I mean, I'm, we could go all night with this, but we can't thank you enough for joining us. Thank you so much for coming on with us. No, I'm yeah, glad. And I think stuff. this is the last thing I'm doing for the year. So that's why I had the extra time. And I know we've been talking about doing this for quite some time. I'm uh, uh, glad to uh, accept your hospitality. And uh, I toast you all with my club soda. Thank you very much. Happy uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Boxing Day, New Year, and uh, all of the other things that people celebrate. So I hope you have a great New Year. And, and let's we'll get see you next to- November in, in Michigan. And let's yeah, let's absolutely. get back to fucking live concerts again. I'm going <laughs> oh, crazy. Yes. I'm going to get a yeah. show soon. Let's go to the big house. and uh, see Yeah, that. we're going to the big house game. to see. I just want to see the show. Hey, thanks for watching our episode with Lou Brutus on Tales from the Pit. If you want to see other guests, check out our YouTube page or check out talesfromthepit.net. We'll see you next time.